Good evening and welcome to the Gandhi Memorial Center. Of course, here this evening we are in the Golden Lotus Temple, also founded by Swami Premananda, the founder of the Mahatma Gandhi Memorial Foundation and the Gandhi Memorial Center. We have our brave and loving souls here this evening to journey out in the rain and cold and dark for what is bright and warm and beautiful here this evening. We are true devotees and friends of Ambassador Nirupama Menon Rao, whom we are honoring this evening with our Fellowship of Peace Award. And though we wish many more of us could join this evening, we are very grateful to share this time with these beloved souls, friends of the Gandhi Center, new friends of the Gandhi Center. And to begin this evening, I would like to invite forth to come and light the lamp, to bring that light for us to share this evening. Srimati Kamala, the founding director of the Gandhi Memorial Center and president of the Mahatma Gandhi Memorial Foundation, Ambassador Nirupama Rao, Ambassador Akbar Ahmed, our very first Fellowship of Peace Award recipient, Assistant Secretary of State Marie Royce, Assistant Secretary of State for Educational and Cultural Affairs with the U.S. State Department. And if you would please join me up here and we will light the lamp. Thank you. Pranam to you all. I have to say a few words to begin about what the Fellowship of Peace Award is and who the awardees are and uh, what's this meant to our institution since we started this with Professor Akbar, Ambassador. Akbar Ahmed, uh, who unfortunately is the only one, the most long time and senior of the awardees and the only one who's able to be with us tonight. But uh, I had the other names that were here and had to cross them off as they were either out of the country or unable to come uh, from weather or other circumstances. But so you, sir, on behalf of all of them, we give our great attention to and appreciation for, because uh, it is you fellows of the Fellowship of Peace who continue a tradition that's uh, very important to us, and your presence is extremely important to us. I want to say how this, what it means to be an awardee, Everyone who has come over these years, what, six or seven people, Karunati, we have seven today. That's like 
after the Chata Chakra, there's the Shamadi. The uh, uh, there are people who, first of all, they were drawn to the Gandhi Center. That's the first thing. They became known to us as friends, as very dedicated people who worked for, respected, and drew others here because of the life message of Mahatma Gandhi. And by doing so, they also drew people to the highest and noblest of best and best of India's multicultural uh, tradition. So they had an ideal to identify that. They drew others because we don't have a membership in Gandhi Foundation. There's no membership. There's no formal identification, but each, through his or her own chosen vocation, uh, has spread somehow the life message of Gandhiji. That's how it happens. And we're here to appreciate and encourage and support that kind of effort to these awardees, but also in each other and to each other. Because each one of you here has come, many of you, very, very loyally on, over many, many years with that same idea in, in hand. And uh, uh, with Nirupama, we've known her since around 1995 or before as has Ambassador Robin Raphael, who is here sitting just behind Nirupama tonight, and who was also here at the time when Nirupama, you joined us in our presentation, which was drafted by the Indian Embassy to be presented at the Kennedy Center in 1995 for Mahatma Gandhi's 125th birth anniversary. Now we are on the eve of the 150th. And so it's, it's a very important time to think that our roots, yours and our friendship and mutual service and effort were established so many years ago. And I remember seeing you and Kartike, who was just a little youngster of what age? Seven. Seven sitting here as we congregants are sitting here together, uh, in a, perhaps in a church service or perhaps as we rehearsed for the Mohamudgar and uh, for all the rehearsals and those things. So your career has been followed by us and studied by us and uh, I'm not sure, I'm not going to recapitulate all of it because it's in the, the program for everyone to read. And actually, to be honest with you, as far as your career and service, Nirupamaji, it's because of the future. Because of the future. And that I can say for my brother, Akbar Ahmed, and for the other awardees, that those of you who have received this award have done so not because of past presence or past service, but because we look to you for the future. And uh, to be personal for a moment, I looked back at a talk I had given 33 years ago in 1985 called The Gandhian of My Dreams. The Gandhian of My Dreams. And because in, in our experience with this center, you can imagine that when we started in 76, and many people would come, they would say, oh, I knew with Gandhi. My father, I knew Gandhi, I saw him. My father marched with him, my mother knew him, he came to our home, he spoke in my town. People had those kinds of personal memories. Well, they are long gone. They are long gone. Uh, and of course, Gandhian is a term that is, uh, I would say, was never a compliment to Gandhiji. Uh, he was never impressed by it, nor bolstered by it. In fact, he shied away from the term 
with great humility, but also from the conviction, I believe, and from a hope that he had, that he hoped that the ideals were created and could be individually realized and formed in lives anew. And so that's, in a way, what this Fellowship of Peace is. It is these uh, ideals formed in life anew. And at that time in that talk, uh, I quoted Gandhiji, and I'm not going to quote him, but I'll mention some of the fields that he talked about that he envisioned what persons would be as satyagrahis. And he described a businessman, artist, teacher, technocrat, student, parent, all of these different roles. I, I, he did not describe a politician, but that's all right. I don't know. He didn't. But he described all of those in some way that he could envision uh, what they would be as, in every field, a satyagrahi. Because he was not looking backwards. Life can be understood backwards to some extent, but it must be lived forwards, as the historian said. Uh, and all that, does, all that is human retrogrades if it doesn't advance. So it's not with a feeling of uh, uh, ego that we say we are wanting to advance the life message of Mahatma Gandhi. It's with a feeling of uh, if we don't do it, we're not responsible and we don't deserve to be an institution. In institutions require and must deserve life support. Not money. Money needed, of course. But institutions and good ideas fail if they don't have life support. So that's simply what we're here to acknowledge tonight. And in every field, in every field, and all of those who have received these awards, somehow there's the idea of satyagraha as Gandhi described it. Who is a satyagrahi? In Gandhi's own words? In every field, these concerns, self-purification, self-help, sacrifice, and faith in God. That was one who holds on to truth, satyagrahi. So, uh, Nirupamaji, we're here to listen to you. We're here to uh, spend some time with you, uh, very gratefully, and Kartike. And Sudhakar is not here, but he's here in our thoughts also. And uh, to thank you for allowing us to perpetuate this tradition with your presence. And one person who phoned me from Southern Maryland and Karunaji and absolutely could not make it, the young man Perry Carsley, who is the sculptor, sculptor who did all the sculptures of the World War II monument down on the mall, an amazingly talented young man. He, out of love for Gandhi, made this relief plaque. Uh, that you will be receiving tonight. That uh, if you want to, you'll see. Well, Akbar Ahmed has one. All everyone has one, but you have your own, and it's just a, a humble way of saying thank you and having us all remember uh, how much you and your life effort mean to us and to this institution. You have supported this institution with, in a very great way. Thank you all very much. Thank you.
Now, as I introduce our chief guest and honored friend of uh, Ambassador Nirupam Rao, and I hope a friend of Gandhi Center for the future to come, the Assistant Secretary of State for Educational and Cultural Affairs of the State Department. And I just want to, um, rather than recapitulate all of your accolades as an entrepreneur and business executive and professor and now as a cultural ambassador, to let you know the interaction and the wonderful benefit that the Gandhi Center has had from this bureau at the State Department. In the last five, six years, we have received a group of visiting students just before they embark on the Kennedy Luger Yes Abroad Scholarship Program to India. And the organizations that the State Department has worked with to prepare these young students, high school juniors, going abroad to many very uh, different countries, um, and those that are preparing to go to India, they said, well, we would like to bring them to the Gandhi Center to give them a little introduction. So along with their State Department briefings, they come to the Gandhi Center before they fly off to India. And this past year in June, we had about seven students who are currently high school juniors living with families in India and attending high schools in Delhi, Kolkata, Chennai, Ahmedabad, and uh, Mumbai. And another wonderful interaction that we've had uh, with the same Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs is through the International Visitor Leadership Program that the State Department organizes. And it, interestingly, the most recent group we had was actually a group of young leaders from Libya who came and visited the Gandhi Memorial Center on a program to the United States where they were studying resources for conflict resolution. Previous to that, we had a, a very amazing group, which I failed to even uh, describe to Ambassador Rao, that was specifically a program in this Distinguished Visitors Program for arts and peace building. And they happened to be young professionals, artists, journalists from South Asia and Central Asia. And they came to the Gandhi Memorial Center during their stay in Washington, D.C. to meet with other artists that we brought together from the Gandhi Center from South Asia. And so we are finding that there are such wonderful opportunities even for the Gandhi Center, which perhaps doesn't have any direct involvement with the State Department, but through the auspices of these programs of international exchange and culture, we have want, had a very wonderful experience receiving these visitors to the United States, to Washington, D.C., and to the Gandhi Memorial Center. So we're hopefully we'll get to have more opportunities in that realm, and together with Ambassador Rao's future project, we'll hopefully bring more musicians from South Asia. So at this time, I would like to welcome uh, Mrs. Marie Royce, Assistant Secretary of State. Thank you. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. And I want to thank everyone that's here tonight on this uh, wintry uh, day. Uh, first of all, I want to say it's an incredible honor uh, for me to be here and be the honored guest of my very good friend, Ambassador Nira Palmer Rao, and also to Karuna. Karuna. Uh, thank you for all your support of our, our, our young people that have come to the United States um, on these very important bilateral programs. Uh, what we talk about in my uh, bureau is we move people to move ideas. And she mentioned three. One is the, the YES program, which has been going on for 15 years, which is these young students uh, come from many different countries, and they stay for 10 months with host families. And they get to the experience what it's like to be in the United States. But the amazing part is that almost all of them do 200 hours of community service. And actually, there's a photograph I have of them. And I asked for their commitment. I said, will you go back to your uh, home countries? And will you commit to me that you'll be willing to help people every day in your home countries? And everyone went like this and put their hand up. So it was really, really powerful. You mentioned the International Visitor Leadership Program. I also want to mention that Prime Minister uh, Modi is a, one of our alumni. He traveled to the United States on two exchange programs when he was an up-and-coming politician. Another um, 
thing is that we have 20,000 exchange alumni from India, which is pretty powerful. And this, uh, uh, this week is International Education Week, and I just uh, talked at the press club, I was just sharing that with Ambassador Rao, uh, about we have for the third year, one, one million students internationally have come to the United States and study, and, and we're so pleased that India continues to be the second largest number of international students to the United States. So we're so happy about that. And that's a, uh, a number, overall 12.3% a, a increase from the previous year. Another program we have with India is the Fulbright program, which we feel is a really incredibly important program. Um, just from a, a, um, a, I just say, geopolitical standpoint, uh, as you know, we feel that this relationship is one of the most important relations we have with the world's largest democracy. And uh, we have the two plus two dialogue with Secretary Pompeo and Secretary Mattis and our Indian counterparts. Um, and we also have the Indo-Pacific strategy, which some of you might have heard of and how important that is. And of course, India is, of course, a leading security provider in the region, and we want to say thank you for that. But I also want to talk about um, some of the the areas of why I'm so pleased to be here today, and that is for the um, Fellowship of Peace Award. And I just want to say that I mentioned that Nira Palma is my friend. Um, it's not hard to be a friend of Nira Palma's because she's so welcoming. But when she first arrived in Washington, D.C., um, I, I still remember her taking me through the residence and showing me the paintings on the wall, and we talked about music. And uh, that's one of the ways we bonded. And she shared with me never, a number of things. One is uh, she took me to the Kennedy Center and it was a Viviconda. And I went to that. And, and by the way, Kara, Kartikeya, your son, I want to say um, it's great to see you too. And another one was uh, we also had various authors come to the residence. And that was really powerful. Um, and she also kicked off the um, jazz, it was called the Jazz, the DC Jazz Festival. Um, so I, I mentioned that because she was not only a lover of music, but also a lover of jazz. And I had the good fortune of also uh, saying goodbye to Nira Palma when uh, she was leaving her residence. And um, I yeah, presented to her a American flag that had flown over the United States uh, Capitol. And one of the things I mentioned at the speech, which I, I just came back to me in my head, it was so cool, is that she's such an inspiration around the world that uh, there was a, a man in Peru who named his daughter Nira Palma Rodriguez. <laughs> oh, and Nira Palma used to be a diplomat in Peru. And so oftentimes, up, uh, tweeting up is Nira Palma Rodriguez when Nira Palma Rao is tweeting. So I thought to myself, what a great tribute uh, the fact that you would name your daughter after someone uh, who, of course, I believe, and you do too, because you're all here today, who is such an instrument of peace. He's all about preserving peace. And it's really uh, the one-to-one -one individual attention she provides. I also want to share that she gave me uh, her book, and I brought it today, which is in their bio, but it's called Rain Rising Poems. And so I'm just going to read a little piece of that. Um, just only an expert, excerpt of part of a, uh, one, but it's called Old Maps of Hindustan. I'm um, just going to read that. It says, Old Maps of Hindustan, where the Himalayas are slender strips, twisting trellises, yellowing, and published for the diffusion of useful knowledge, India within the Ganges, and India beyond the Ganges, plotting the meridians of our destinations. Such a long story of how the smooth pebbles and sand in my hands Sweat for reasons cataloged in those old maps of Hindustan. But it's a beautiful poetry. And now, Nira Palma's done an album. It's pretty incredible. So I just want to say uh, how impressed I am um, that what you've done here, um, and also with your work with the South uh, Asian Symphony uh, Foundation. So one of the things w which was mentioned is the importance of culture and what we do here at the US Department of State. And I, well, I thought it was appropriate for me to bring a, a very important book today and read something about it. Um, basically, again, I said, Ambassador Rao and I truly believe that art is a powerful tool for diplomacy. And I want to talk to you a little bit about this book. It's called Jam Session, America's Jazz Ambassadors. This is from 60 years ago. And it's, it's, this, 
This is about the program that we created to send people out into the world to do music. And I'm going to show you page uh, 16. And I'm going to, I signed that and I'm going to give this to you along with a, um, the musicians that are part of this. Uh, Louis Armstrong, who went to Cairo, who played his trumpet in front of the pyramids. And thousands and thousands of people came out. Why? One, they love music, but they'd never seen an American before. So these are the soft diplomacy tools. Uh, what I have here is Dave Brubeck, who went out and played Take Five in Pakistan, in India. And so what we see in the picture here is Dave Brubeck and Paul Desmond Center encountering Indian musicians in Bombay, India in 1958. Pretty powerful. In fact, I just was at a um, professional fellows event today. A young Pakistani a, a man came and talked to me about uh, his dad had actually seen Dave Brubeck in 1958. So just talking about the power of music, the power of uh, tools of diplomacy. So I'm going to just read uh, um, from here real quick because I think it's really powerful. Perhaps the most successful cultural diplomacy of our time was our Jazz Ambassadors program. It transcended national boundaries and brought people together through an appreciation of these musicians' singular talents. Millions encountered the jazz ambassadors in formal and formal settings and gained a positive view of the United States. In 1958, 60 years ago, jazz pianist and composer Dave Brubeck, known for Take Five, and his quartet traveled to India as envoys on behalf of the US in the late 50s. In one instance, he tried to capture some of India's sounds in his Calcutta blues by incorporating Indian, Indian rhythms into the composition. So I just thought you'd like to have a copy of this book and some music to go along with it. But what I want to say is that in the, um, Nira Palmer Rao understands the power of, of what music does. And just like Gandhi, how powerful that is for promoting peace. I was reading about the symphony orchestra and what her plans are with workshops and working with these young musicians. Um, that is exactly the type of program that we try to promote. And the other thing I want to add is I have been uh, to Gandhi's home um, twice. I've, three times I've been to India, and two times I've, the two of the three times I've went back to Gandhi's home. Gandhi was an inspiration. And I also wanted to share what you were mentioning about all the facets of Ambassador Rao. Um, she's a mother. She's a diplomat. She's a musician. She's a singer. She's a friend. She's a, a person that creates, creates NGOs and nonprofit organizations. She's a person that writes poetry. She's a person that teaches. She's a person that tweets. I get a lot of, I follow her. <laughs> so what I'm say, saying to you is, I think Gandhi would be very proud of you. Uh, and, I, I'll, and I am proud of you. So I really appreciate you asking me to be your honored guest today. Um, you have so much talent and you've given so much to the world. Um, and I want to say what you are doing with young people uh, is incredibly inspiring. Um, and on behalf of um, my, my position, I will say um, just the people-to-people -people ties of not only what you're doing in the U.S. and India, but what your plans are, and I was reading your about your foundation, into eight countries in the South, in, in, right, basically in the Asia region, right? So this is really going to transform India. And I've, I just really feel that you uh, really have it right as far as preserving peace. So with that, I'd just like to say congratulations on your well-deserved honor. Uh, and uh, it's just a great, uh, great for me to have this opportunity to be here. And Ambassador, congratulations on your previous honor and what you've done in your position. And I also, and I, this is your lovely wife. But I just want to say thank you um, for everyone here who is a friend of Nair Palmer Rao. Um, you know, it's really a commitment uh, for you to come out and, uh, tonight, but to be able to see her get this recognition. And I was reading the program, and it sounds like we're going to get to hear a musical piece. So this is very exciting. So anyway, thank you for having me. And Ambassador, I'm going to give you um, this little uh, book and this jazz album. So let me see. And, and that's basically our program for the U.S. We had Dizzy Gillespie, Duke Ellington, Benny Goodman, uh, Louis Armstrong, Miles Davis, uh, Dave Rube, I mean, goes on and on. But these, oh, yeah, and Quincy Jones. I actually just met Quincy uh, two weeks ago. 
he had gone out as an envoy for us, and uh, he opened it up and he just said, this is just incredible. I can still remember what it like, was like just back from 1956 when I went out and represented the US and, and had hundreds of young people coming out to see me. Uh, it's the same thing that your foundation is gonna be doing. Uh, you're gonna be changing lives with this uh, orchestra. And I also want to just share this one piece because I had the good fortune of introducing the ambassador more than once and getting to know her. I still remember her telling me uh, about the fact, and if, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but you wanted to be a diplomat since you were 11 years old. Isn't that right? Yeah, so I said to her, Ambassador, when did you want to become a diplomat? She said, when I was 11, I, I made it a goal. And uh, <laughs> so I, I say that because it's so inspiring. Because Ambassador Rao, when she has a goal, I think we better all move out of the way, don't you think? <laughs> but you, you make it happen. And, you, and she always has a smile. So thank you. Thank you very much, Assistant Secretary Royce, for those remarks. I think we will not forget now about this jazz program, uh, ambassadorial program. Now, on to the musical element of this evening. This is a very, very special um, offering, not just from the Gandhi Center and from the musicians whom you will be hearing up here, but from the ambassador herself. This song, Peace is My Dream, is from the album of the same name that Ambassador Rao has recently recorded and released. And what was very inspiring to me was when I learned that the phrase that she wrote the lyrics based upon, let us sweat in peace, not bleed in war, an expression of Ambassador Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit. And going back, and for those of you who may not know, Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit was the first woman ambassador from India to the United States. She was the first woman president of the UN General Assembly. She, on a more personal note, I'm told by Kamala Ji, that during her tenure as ambassador in Washington in the late 40s, she used to bring cakes to Swami Premananda, who was the director, first the founding director of the founding founder of the Gandhi Memorial Center and Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi Memorial Foundation. So that sweet quality that she brought to our very institution in her expression of thankfulness and gratitude. Tonight will be presented in a very loving way with the youth of the future, of music, of the Fellowship of Peace through music. Because this evening we have a very young lady who will be offering the singing of this composition which was arranged by our own Jeffrey Hallenbauer. The music originally composed by Martha and Robert Henrat, also of this area of Montgomery County, and sung by Zeta Bauscher, who is a 13-year-old student in the Montgomery County, Maryland area, and a student of Jeff Bauer, who is a Peabody Conservatory um, graduate and also uh, has his master's in ethnomusicology, where he focused his research and music on the bowels, the uh, music uh, that influenced Rabindranath Tagore. This evening, this very, very lovely offering, I think will be the first time that this song is presented in the US. I believe Ambassador Rao performed it herself, singing her own lyrics in India for the launch of the South Asian Symphony Foundation and for the launch of her CD. So at this time, I would like to invite Mr. Jeffrey Hallenbauer and Ms. Zeta Bauscher.
And we're very glad that Zeda's parents and brother are here this evening to appreciate and enjoy with us.
simply beautiful, Zeda and Jeff. And I left out one important piece of information that Zeda is not only a wonderful singer, a piano player, but she is also a composer. And earlier this year, she performed singing and playing the piano, her own composition at the Montgomery County Composer Society. So we're looking forward to much more. Now before we present the Fellowship of Peace Award plaque, I do want to extend a wonderful thanks to each and every one of you who are here this evening. And please know that we have a lot of food for all of you who are able to join us in the Gandhi Center Library just across the street after uh, Ambassador Rao's remarks. So please don't run away. We would love for you to stay and enjoy a wonderful dinner and to spend some time with Ambassador Rao. Um, at this time, Kamlaji, would you come forward with Ambassador Rao and we will present the Fellowship of Peace Award. Ambassador Nirvama Rao, we are so honored and pleased to share with you this fellowship. It's not just an award, it's not just a plaque, but this is a lifelong and beyond fellowship of peace. Thank you. So Thank you. If it's too heavy to put in your luggage on Tuesday, I'm sure Kartik will hold on to it for you. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. I'll put it here. Srimati Kamalaji, Srimati Karunaji, Assistant Secretary Royce, my dear friend, Ambassador Ahmed, and all my dear friends gathered here this evening, this very rainy, windy, rather bleak evening, but lit up now by the warmth of your friendship and the love all around us and the spirit of Mahatma Gandhi, I'm sure, looking over us today. My association with the Gandhi Memorial Center goes back for more than two decades, as Srimati Kamalaji just told you. Uh, it's been a long association and an association that I have truly treasured because for me, it has meant not only the friendship that I have received from all of you, but also the many hours of music and comradeship, the sense of brotherhood and sisterhood that I've felt with each and every one of you. And I've come back again and again. It's as if I've made this pilgrimage to the Gandhi Center, wherever I've been. Even when I was in Peru as ambassador, I remember being in touch with the Gandhi Center uh, to get not only literature, but ideas about events that I was planning in Lima, in Peru. And uh, there was enormous receptivity even there for many of the uh, ideas and the principles that you stand for. And I remember the Moha Mudgar celebration, the performance that we held at the Kennedy Center with Ambassador Siddhartha Shankar Ray and uh, Kamla Ji and friends. And um, the then First Lady, Mrs. Clinton, came to that event and uh, spoke uh, about uh, the principles of Gandhi and the spirit of nonviolent action that should continue to animate all our efforts for global peace and brotherhood, even today, particularly in the 21st century, when everything seems to be redefined and questioned and segregated into many, many definitions. I think we need that wholeness that brings it all together. Having Assistant Secretary Royce here today is very special for me, particularly. And let me tell you that in Marie Royce, you have a very unique individual. Uh, 
completely genuine, completely honest, and inquiring, receptive, curious, everything I think that should go to make a global citizen today. You not only belong to the United States, I think you belong to women all around the world. I think you stand for the, the best that one can accept, ex expect in a friend and uh, in a woman who has not only achieved a great deal in her professional domain, but has not forgotten the qualities of humanity and compassionate uh, dealings that I think should animate everything we do. And I'm very happy to see Ambassador Rafe, uh, Robin Rafel here. Uh, she and I also go back a very long way. And she has been closely associated with South Asia for many decades, as you know. And it's a privilege to have you here today also, and to all my friends who have joined us at this moment. And thank you, Zeda and Jeff. I think it was a beautiful rendition of Peace is My Dream. And uh, you did it much better than I could have ever done. And uh, thank you, and I wish you the very best in all your future musical and academic endeavors. Uh, you're growing up, and I'm sure you'll be a wonderful um, citizen of your country and also bring the peace, a message of peace to everyone around the world through music, which is what my foundation, the South Asian Symphony Foundation, uh, sets out to do. Uh, because our region of South Asia, consisting of the eight countries of Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and the Maldives, uh, is meant to be much closer together. Uh, someone once said, the former foreign minister of Sri Lanka, who was unfortunately assassinated, Lakshman Kadirgamar, used to always say that South Asia is an integer. It's meant to be much more closely integrated. We have our political divisions, but those divisions should not keep us apart from fulfilling our common humanity. And uh, we share so much. Our destiny is shared, really. And uh, we prosper together. We should grow together. We should build connections, build bridges, and uh, move beyond narrow differences. And that is really the idea of the symphony orchestra that I'm trying to set up. I'm in the process of setting up. We have a concert coming up at the National Center for the Performing Arts in Mumbai in April 2019. And uh, at this moment, we are, in a sense, bringing the orchestra musicians together. Our conductor is an Indian American from Houston, Vishwa Subaraman. Uh, we have uh, our concert master, who is a Goan, but who lives in Belgium, and uh, she's a violinist. And uh, we have a Pakistani-American from New York, who's our bass player. And we have a, uh, one of the cellists is from Bangladesh. Uh, we have musicians from Nepal, from Sri Lanka, from India, from Afghanistan, all lining up to join the orchestra. And particularly the experience with Afghanistan has been so soul-stirring, I can't even begin to tell you, because we all know, uh, you know what the situation in Afghanistan is, what life in Kabul can be. And in the midst of all that uh, violence and the bombings and the religious extremism, and uh, the pressures that normal life has come under, you have these young musicians, all Afghans, who are part of the Afghan National Institute of Music, who are such excellent artists, so passionately dedicated to what they're doing. I think it should be an example that we should be citing to youth everywhere around the world. And the individual stories that they have to tell of how uh, yes, they've faced a lot of depression and despondence when they see death and destruction around them, and how they have, through music, renewed hope in their lives. And they do it so well. They're all excellent musicians. It's not just that they're playing uh, the piano or the violin or the oboe. It's just that they are so excellent by any world standard. So having them as a part of our effort I think really lifts us up, is like kind of provides wind beneath our wings, as it were. So I want all of you, uh, I'm sure all of you, will support this idea 
of building the South Asian Symphony so that we, like the West Eastern Divan Orchestra between Israel and Palestine, uh, has shown to the world how young Israelis and Palestinians can come together and form you know, human attachments. I hope we'll be able to do the same for the young people of South Asia. And that's really my dream. When I talk of peace is my dream, that is my dream. I have prepared a few remarks, and thank you so much for this award. I'm deeply honored, and I shall try my best to live up to the ideals that this award stands for and everything uh, that it means for all of us to have a future, as you said. Kamlaji, you emphasized that this is for the future, and it's that future that we must all come together to build a peaceful future. For almost all of my adult life, I have practiced a profession that is diplomacy, that concerns the parts of peace rather than war. Of course, diplomacy has also some other meanings, it covers strategy, it covers geopolitics, it covers competition and rivalry, maintenance of the status quo, sometimes we're wedded to that, providing a velvet glove to narrow nationalism, and by bypassing the common ground of mutual accommodation and mutual benefit. Perhaps the time has come now for some introspection about where this all leads us and why we are not exercising the capacity that we all possess for allowing voice and agency for common ground, for equality and mutual benefit. Too often in the 21st century, we are literally webbed worldwide by a selective amnesia about matters that do not fit into our concept of what reality should look like, an entirely notional definition of reality, might one say. Our memories are refracted through the prism of perceived injustice and fragments of exaggerated representations of subjective histories. There is an absence of awareness of who we are as a whole, as civilizations, as composite cultures, as human beings who should celebrate their unity in diversity and a collective and universal humanism. In putting my thoughts together for today, I reflected on the annals of diplomacy in my lifetime, and my mind's eye was focused on the memory of Dag Hammarskjöld, the Swedish public servant who became the Secretary General of the United Nations in 1953 and stayed in office until his tragic death in an air crash in Africa in 1961. What drew me to Dag, as he was affectionately termed in the media of his time, leave it to Dag was the slogan, was his respect for the word. And I say that because we diplomats deal in the currency of words. That is our sovereign asset, as it were. He said, respect for the word is the first requirement in the discipline through which a human being can be nurtured to maturity, intellectually, emotionally, and morally. Respect for the word, using it with the strictest care and an uncompromising inner love of truth is also for the society and the human race a condition for growth. To misuse the word is to show contempt for man. It undermines the bridges and poisons the springs. In this way, it leads us backward on the long road of human evolution. And I use the word peace in my following remarks in that sense, respecting it, weighing it carefully. Undermining the bridges and poisoning the springs, is it not that which pollutes the human discourse today? Let us ask ourselves, pointing the searchlight inwards, let us be aware of the grounds of our own behavior. Let us open our minds, for the closed mind never learns never absorbs, never wakes up. Let us be active and let us also be contemplative. Why do I say this? I've been, and Marie you know, showed you my book of poems, I've been an aspiring poet in my lifetime and I've had to ward off the skeptics who felt that the twain of poetry and diplomacy can never meet. But here again, Dag Hammarskjöld is the answer to every poet diplomat's search for an answer 
to these skeptics. He called poetry, and I quote, a necessary and indispensable complement to diplomacy. The diplomat, like the poet, works with words, transposes words, using them as the key, although not necessarily the master key, unquote. I think the poet W.H. Auden put it eloquently when he said that we need that rare, bountiful marriage of the via activa and the via contemplativa, the active and the contemplative life, to preserve the silence within amid the noise, to remain open and quiet, a moist humus in the fertile darkness where the rain falls and the grain ripens, no matter how many tramp across the parade ground in whirling dust under the arid sky." Unquote. And that is why culture, as in the arts and diplomacy, are intertwined worlds. They complement each other. They help you maintain a balance which we can lose so easily. This blend of two worlds helps us gain a universal view a universal perspective, and to consider diversity as wealth, to gain a depth of understanding, and to develop the art of compassionate listening. What is diplomacy without the balance and without the cultivation of the open mind and the open eye? Today, uh, the our neck of the woods approach undermines the awareness of the single garment of destiny that cloaks us all, to paraphrase Martin Luther King. The acceptance of the commons is what I'm referring to. The world is being fractured into numerous, numerous shards of groups and individual loyalties and creeds. And again, to quote Dag Hammarskjöld, we have forgotten that the weakness of one is the weakness of all, and the strength of one, not the military strength, but the real strength, the economic and social strength, the happiness of people is the strength of all. Oneness is our inheritance, and we must hold it in trust for future generations. There is a cosmos of connections in a single flower, as the art of Georgia O'Keeffe demonstrated. And the virtues of solidarity, integrity, humanism go into this concept, and together they make for peace. Not the peace that is submission, or the white flag of surrender, but peace that brings empowerment of all, equality, and a safer world. I think as public servants who are currently serving and who have served, we must be conscious of the inequalities that surround us. We must be that 1% who keep the conscience, who are eternally aware of the fact that while globalization has provided great benefits by improving life expectancy, education, knowledge, providing livelihoods, has also increased inequality. Eight men, I mean men, own as much as the poorest half of the global population. The rust belts have a case. The left behind, left behinds or the people disadvantaged, they are stirring and they'll slumber no more. At the same time, can we ignore universal threats to our security as humans, conflict, climate change, the tragedy of forced migration, populism, authoritarianism, nationalism, and protectionism? Are international norms that define our collective good being bypassed and ignored? We need a middle path, the right balance of the rights of the individual, the demands of social justice, of inclusive democracy, and the imperatives of global progress and economic well-being. Mahatma Gandhi, whose spirit shines over us today in this special set setting, was the quintessential open mind. That is why nothing human in goodness of thought and inclusive belief in spirituality above religiosity was foreign to him. Tolstoy, whom Gandhiji respected deeply, as we all know, was imaging and visualizing Gandhiji when he defined greatness as constituting simplicity, goodness, and truth. Reading Tolstoy's grand and epic novel of the Napoleonic War, War and Peace, you begin to visualize the beauty and mystery of life 
of the nature of our earth and its bounty. And you all also understand what a terrible thing war is. What a terrible thing. War is not a polite recreation, to paraphrase Tolstoy. It's the vilest thing in life. And we ought to realize this and not make a game of it. Are not civilization and violence antithetical concepts, as Martin Luther King said? In his eloquent words, we have to transform this pending cosmic elegy of the art of learning to live together in peace into a creative psalm of brotherhood. Those were his words. Yes, you need the audacity to believe in peace in the future of mankind. We are not mere flotsam and jetsam in the river of life, as King said. We must be other-centered rather than self-centered, and we must believe not only in food security, but the security provided by education, by culture, and by the awesome stature that dignity, equality, and freedom provide us with. These are more than just simple gifts. They are more precious than diamonds or gold or the military industrial complex. It's now 100 years since the end of World War I. As we recite an anthem for the doomed youth of the generation that fought in that war, I came across a recent article that quoted a letter written by a wounded Sikh soldier in that war to his father in 1915, when the war had just begun. This young man called it a devil's war, which it was. A young soldier from Garhwal in India's Himalayan belt wrote, and I quote, it is very hard to endure the bombs, father. There is no confidence of survival. The bullets and cannonballs come down like snow. The mud is up to a man's middle. The distance between us and the enemy is 50 paces. The numbers that have fallen cannot be counted." Unquote. What more graphic descriptions can be provided about war, about the cannonballs, about the enveloping mud, the cold, and the overwhelming numbers of the fallen? Most of all, how in combat, even if they are separated by 50 paces, the fighter and the fought, the victor and the vanquished, the living and the fallen are victims of a demeaning of their common humanity. The Gandhian and the untiring crusader for justice, the late Nirmala Deshpande said, I quote, let me look at the world with friendly eyes so that the world will look to us with friendly eyes, unquote. The Yajur Veda, a voice from India's millennial spiritual tradition of peace and nonviolence, prays for peace in the heavens, peace in the atmosphere, peace on earth, coolness in the water, healing in the herbs, and peace radiating from the trees, of harmony in the planets and the stars, and perfection in eternal knowledge, of shanti, of peace. And that word shanti, the Sanskrit word for peace, for harmony, for concord, signifies more than just the absence of war or conflict. I associate it more with the sound of the universe itself, where calm and bliss acquire a sublime transcendence. Or the Hebrew word shalom, or peace, which means to be safe in mind, body, or estate. A sense of completeness or wholeness. Again, as the Yajurveda says, let not the battle cry rise amidst the many slain, nor the arrows of the war god fall with the break of day. Or in the words of Valmiki in the Ramayana, the Indian epic, the Ramayana, the chariot that leads to victory is of another kind. Valor and fortitude are its wheels. Truthfulness and virtuous conduct are its banner. Strength, discretion, self-restraint, and benevolence are its four horses, harnessed with the cords of forgiveness, compassion, and equanimity. Whoever has this righteous chariot has no enemy to conquer anywhere." Unquote. What we therefore need is a public philosophy of nonviolence. I think Ralph Nader said that also some time ago. A culture of peace, disseminating this through peace studies in our educational institutions. We need to understand the value of negotiation, of compromise, of non-coercion, of reconciliation. 
As the American singer Jackson Brown said recently, we need to make more common cause with peace. We need to show up for each other when we see discrimination or injustice anywhere. We need causes without borders, causes to protect and preserve like human rights, poverty alleviation, economic inequality, the environment, about reuniting and rejoining a broken world, about putting our planet first and making it collectively great again. Speaking yesterday in Sydney while accepting the Sydney Peace Prize, Joseph Stiglitz, the economist, said, I quote, the only sustainable prosperity is shared prosperity, unquote. So finally, let peace be our means of survival. Let it be more than the stuff that dreams are made of. And let me end with these lines from Jackson Brown and his song, The Dreamers. Where do the dreams go, born of faith and illusion, where there is no road or footprints, only desires that whisper to your heart? Eagles fly on the columns of the wind. Fish swim the currents of the sea. People cross oceans and deserts and rivers, carrying nothing more than the dream of what life could be. And that is why peace is my dream. It's the dream of life that we carry within us and we must bequeath to the future. It is a dream that was denied to that young Sikh or Garwali soldier in the trenches in Flanders, or to that drowned young Syrian ref refugee child dressed carefully in his best clothes, his socks and shoes put on by parents who wanted him safe from war, washed up on a foreign shore. Should we not sweat in peace instead of bleeding in war? The answer resides within us. We must become that answer. Om Shanti. Ambassador Rao, and this will conclude the ceremony part of our evening, and we will now like to invite you all to gather your coats and blankets and join us across the street in the Gandhi Center for a wonderful, delicious meal. Thank you. And you will see in the Gandhi Center slides showing on the wall images from Ambassador Rao's time in Washington area interactions with the Gandhi Center and her South Asian Symphony Foundation. Please join us. Thank you.